I think the one thing in life that people are more afraid of than, than death and public speaking is an IRS audit. Right. So I'm g- going to give people a rule, a rule, a rule that if they follow this rule, they will never have to lose sleep over an IRS audit. And here's the rule. And everybody sh- sh- just write this down. Welcome. This is the Lifetime Cash Flow through Real Estate Investing Podcast. This is where you'll learn strategies to help you achieve lifetime financial freedom through real estate investment. Your host, Rod Cleef, has owned over 2,000 homes and apartments, and he brings experts in all aspects of real estate investment and management onto the show. Now, here's your host, Rod Cleef. Welcome to another edition of How to Build Lifetime Cash Flow Through Real Estate Investing. I'm Rod Cleef, and I'm thrilled you're here. I know you're going to get incredible value from the gentleman we're interviewing today. His name is Tom Wheelwright. He's a CPA, and I know Tom because I actually have some of his books on my uh, on my uh, <laughs> library, in my library. Tom uh, is author of the bestseller, Tax-Free Wealth, which I highly recommend. And uh, you know, to tell you a little bit about Tom, Tom uh, was selected by Donald Trump to be in his Wealth Builders program and called Tom the best of the best. So you know, that's a huge endorsement. And I know Tom has uh, done a lot of contribution to Robert Kiyosaki. Kiyosaki and Robert Kiyosaki's books. I know he's in, he's contributed to the Real Book of Real Estate. Also contributed to Rich Dad Success Stories, Who Took My Money, Unfair Advantage, and his newest book, uh, Why A Students Work for C Students. So Tom's been around the real estate business his whole life, and we're very lucky to have him on the show. Tom, I'm thrilled you're here, buddy. Hey, thanks, Rod. It's uh, it's good to be here. I always love talking to real estate investors, uh, both those who are currently real estate investors, those who are aspiring to be real estate investors. Uh, you know, my my background is is heavy in tax and and mostly real estate tax. And uh, great thing about real estate is, is that, uh, you know, when people ask, uh, you remember when they asked Donald Trump, you know, do you really not pay any taxes? And he right. kind of said, yeah, I, I don't because I'm smart. I'm going, you know, his, frankly, his tax uh, advisors would have to be complete idiots for Donald Trump to be paying tax because real estate's just such a good um, it has so so many, so many good tax benefits. No question. No question. You know, uh, we've, we've, um, you know, we've talked about one of them on the show here, cost segregation, which is, you know, a fantastic uh, tool that uh, that you can use to accelerate your depreciation uh, your first few years of ownership, which is a great benefit if you're bringing investors in or even if you're doing your own deals. But uh, I know that uh, your book, Tax-Free Wealth, gets into a lot of this stuff. Let's talk about some of the other tax strategies because you're obviously an expert in tax. You know, can you speak about like-kind exchanges? That's not a topic we've talked about on my show. Yeah, sure. So, First of all, um, and, and I, I know you just did a, a thing on cost seg, so I'm right. not, I don't want to go into to any detail on that. But I want to just kind of step back a second and let everybody just remind everybody the purpose of the tax law. You know, Perfect. there's been a lot of discussion about uh, you know loopholes and you know the the rich have these advantages and and boy, you know Donald Trump must be a crook because he doesn't pay any taxes and. You know, and and then what you get is I I, I remember um, several years ago I was watching a um, just a an email exchange on on a chat room um, for CPAs and they were talking about cost segregations and the question is you know is it legal is it you know is this something risky and so forth and and I'm watching this I'm going are these people real people I mean are they serious so yeah. just just to, to just to confirm what you guys heard on cost segregations um, cost segregations are not simply okay they're technically required under the law wow so what what the law says is the law says that you uh, a you must take the proper amount of depreciation and if you're not doing the cost segregation I will tell you you're not taking the proper amount of depreciation and in, in addition the law actually says that if you don't do a cost segregation now the IRS doesn't go along with this but if you don't do a cost segregation your 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 basis in other words the the, the tax basis of your property is reduced by it by what it should have been had you done a cost segregation. So technically, if the IRS were to follow the letter of the law, then you when you sell a property, you would be taxed as if you'd done a cost segregation, even if you didn't do it. So that's now, wow. now they they publicly said we're not going to do that, right. but that's what the law says. No so kidding. what on top of that, in the IRS audit, there's a whole IRS audit guide on cost segregations. The IRS audit guide tells you step by step how to do this. Okay, so okay. there's there's nothing. Not only there's nothing risky to doing cost segregation. The only thing risky is if you do it yourself. The only thing risky is if you know you um, 
you know, you go out there and, 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 and your CPA just says, oh, well, let's just do an estimate. That's risky. Right. Well, anytime you do something that you're using professionals, you're doing it the right way, these are intended benefits. This is my point. In the tax law, the tax law has one line that says all income's taxable, unless we say it isn't. One line. And then it has about 29 pages of charts and tables that tells you how much tax to pay. But it's got about the, the other 6,000 pages of the, of the U.S. tax law is a guide to reducing your taxes. It's just, okay, if you do this, you can reduce your tax. If you do this, you can reduce your taxes. Okay, it, it, there are a couple of penalties in there. If you do this, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're going to slap you on the wrist. But the, the reality is most of it is a guide to reducing your taxes. And the reason is very simple, Rod. It's because what the government, not just the U.S. government, but this is all over the world, what the government decided 50, 60 years ago, they finally realized that people hate paying taxes. Right. right. I mean, with it, with with the uh, with the Tax Act in, in 1944 that started taxing the average person. Right. The average person wasn't taxed until 1944. But with that, <laughs> that's when withholding came in. We started taxing employees. Before that, employees were never taxed. So with that, you know, by the 19 by by the early 60s, the government realized, wow, people really hate paying taxes. Well, if if somebody hates doing something and you actually give them and, and you actually give them a benefit towards that. So you say, well, look, what if we didn't make you pay so much tax? What would happen? And they started with the, what, what we called the investment tax credit back in the early 60s. They said, look, if we give businesses an incentive for investing in equipment, will they buy more equipment? And sure enough, they did. Right. Okay, because, because we all hate paying taxes. There's, there's nobody on earth who likes paying taxes. There's not, I, I've never met one single person who likes paying taxes. So, so it makes sense for the government. If the government has policies, they say, we want this policy, we want to encourage this policy. What, what's the best way to do that? Well, you could give them a handout. That's what they do with agriculture, right? I mean, there's a lot of subsidies in agriculture. Mm -hmm. But it's actually not as beneficial it's not a, it doesn't work as well as a tax benefit and the reason is twofold one is it's the tax benefits are actually easier to administer they're they're very efficient in the administration but second of all a dollar of tax benefit is emotionally worth more than a dollar to us because we hate paying taxes so people will take an action i'll give you a perfect example there are people out there probably listening to us right now there are people who have put money into a 401k even, right. even even better, there are probably people who put money into a 529 plan, a, a, a covered L IRA, education IRA. These are not good ideas. No kidding. I mean, I mean, think about this. You, you, you've you've turned your money over to a situation where you do not control how much you can put in. You don't control what you can invest in. You're very limited. You don't control when you can take it out. When you do take it out, you can't control your taxes, and you may get a penalty. And eventually, you have to take it out. Or you get another penalty. Hmm. So there's there's nothing conceptually good about giving turning your money over to control of somebody else where you really have the, – the government basically is controlling what you're doing. So why do people do it? The only reason people do it – and I'm not the only reason because some employers give a match and, and people argue that you know it, it's worth it. And for some people it probably is. But the real reason people do it is because they get a tax break. But it's only a temporary tax break even. It's not even a, you know, it's a tax break until they have to take it out. And then they have to take it out and then they have to pay taxes on it. And if they take it out early, before the 15 and a half, they pay, have to pay a penalty on it. They're still willing to do it because they want the tax break. So I'm just, I just so want to give that example. So what's the alternative? What's the alternative, Tom? Well, yeah, uh, quite frankly, the alternative is what you talk about, right? right. It's real. I mean, real estate's a huge alternative. It's, right. it's planning for your retirement outside of what's called a qualified plan. If you think, if you hear the term qualified plan, which is 401k, IRA, um, uh, pension plan, private sharing plan, these are all 403b, 457, these are all qualified plan. Qualified means government regulated and government restricted. Then we have what's called a non-qualified plan, which includes uh, limited liability companies, family limited partnerships, you know, uh, owning your own corporation. It's all of these things. These are called non-qualified plans that you can still have a plan. It's just not, it's just not restricted by the government. Qualified equals restricted. So because of that, you can set yourself up in a, you can develop a strategy, this, this whole plan where you can be reducing your taxes and, uh, uh you know, I, I have clients that make millions of dollars in their business, but because 
they have done their their tax strategy properly, and they then and, and they do a lot of real estate investing or oil and gas or some other uh, tax favored investing. They don't pay any tax, right? No, so it it's, and it, it's not because it's a loophole. It's because the government wants housing built, so they give they give tax benefits for housing. They want commercial commercial properties being built, so they give tax benefits for owning commercial properties. I mean, this is just it's just the government's way of saying, look, if you do what we tell you to do, we're going to give you tax benefit. That's you're basically. Fundamentally, partnering with the government. No, no, I, I told. I mean, I I can speak personally. You know, when I when I had eight hundred houses and multiple apartment complexes, I never paid a dime of tax, and I made I put a lot of money in my pocket, and I never paid a dime. And and you know the the benefits with real estate. Uh, and so those of you that don't believe this, it's 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 real. And and that's the, the, uh, frankly, this is one of the biggest benefits of real estate. If if you forgot everything else, if you forgot the fantastic cash flow, the appreciation, the you know someone else paying down your debt. I mean, the, the tax benefits are absolutely fantastic. So I know, so, so let's get back to my question. To speak about okay. like kind, kind exchanges for a second. And I appreciate all that because that was a great, okay. great framework. Uh, just, just, yeah, that, that's all I want to do. I just want yeah. to give people a framework. Yeah. Um, for, one, one thing, just as we get into like kind exchanges, remember a like kind exchange, we're going to do this with real estate we don't own in an IRA or 401k. Right. Owning real estate in an IRA, 401k, there are very limited times when you would do that. 99% of the time, you will never want to do that. In fact, if you're going to invest in real estate and you're going to use debt leverage the way that real estate's intended, right. the, 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 the great benefit here, and you're going to be you know, you know, directing your investment yourself, to put it into a 401k or an IRA is to actually give up all of your tax benefits and take a non-taxable event and make it taxable. So that, mm. that, that's first thing. Plus, you lose, you lose a lot of your leverage. So that being said, one of the great things we can do is we, we call it defer till you die, right? Defer till you die. Yeah. So here's what happens. And this actually, um, people are kind of wondering also about what kind of tax legislation changes. And there's actually a, a potential consequence here. Now, first thing we know is with the current administration, like kind exchanges are going to be safe for four years. Okay. okay. We are not going, to, uh, we're not going to have a president who owns billions of dollars in real estate eliminate the like kind exchange provisions. That is not going to happen. <laughs> right, okay. Right. So let's not be worrying about that. But basically what, um, what a like kind exchange is for people who are not, not familiar with them is um, if normally when you sell an asset, you recognize, in other words, you're taxed on a gain, whatever gain or loss there is, which is the amount you receive minus the basis. And the basis is what you paid for it minus any depreciation you took. Okay. That's your basis in the property plus any improvements you made. So that's basically right. your basis. So that's your tax basis. That's what that's, the IRS is going to use to, to tax you based on that basis. Correct. That is correct. Okay. So, so normally when you, when you sell or exchange, mm -hmm. the, the rule is sale or exchange a, a, a property, for example, you're going to pay tax on that gain, or you're going to get the benefits of that loss. If you do what's called a like kind exchange, 1031, also called 1031, that's the right. code section. Right. Okay. Also, like, mm. also called a Starker exchange. There's there's okay. other names for it, okay. but that that the appropriate name is a like kind exchange. Okay. Okay. Because there's actually like kind exchanges that are not under section 1031. You may not. Oh, not, I did not, not know I that. Actually, I actually didn't that, know that. And I've done a ton of 1031. Okay. Oh, well, let me reframe. I've done a ton of like kind of changes in my history, uh, and I always called them 1031. So that's good to know. Right. And probably okay. the, the, the like kind exchanges you did were under section. 1031, but there's right. also 1032, 1033, and 1034, and 1035. Oh, wow. Okay? okay. So those are different types of exchanges. For example, the government comes in and takes your property. You can do an exchange with that, even though the government took it and you got the money. So that's hmm. different than the 1031. So the okay. rules are different. Okay. Now, in the 1031 exchange, what you're doing is, and it's, it's not really direct for direct. Now, there are a couple of rules. First of all, you, you can exchange any property that is held for investment or business, okay, so not personal. So your personal residence, you're not going to do this with. Right. Your, 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 your lakeside home, you're not going to do this with, okay, right. that you use personally. You're Invest, not going to do this with your second, your second home. This is investment or business, okay? Oh, so okay. you use it in your medical practice, you can do this, okay? You use it in your, you know, you have a retail store, you know, pizza shop, you can do this, okay? That, that's held for business. So business or investment, 
And it has to be exchanged. In other words, what you have to do is you have to end up using the proceeds to buy another property that is for investment or business. So in other words, you can't exchange a house that, 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 that you use for vacation. Uh, you can't exchange that for, your, um, for a business property. You can't exchange, nor can you go the other way. So you can't sell your fourplex that you've held for investment and then exchange that for a personal residence. Okay, right. I just want to be clear. Investment Second of all, investment, but but I want to I want to add one clarifying point and the, and it's confusing to people that don't know this. You're thinking like kind exchange, you think if you sell a fourplex, you have to find somebody else that happens to want your fourplex. That's not the case at all. It's right. it's it's you use the proceeds to buy a similar type property, i.e. investment property. And right. So. So, 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 so let me actually, actually, actually walk everybody through that, how okay. that works. So for, first of all, I just want to just set out some of the, the, the broader rules. First of all, you, you also you can exchange any kind of investment property for any other kind of investment property as long as it's within the U.S. or foreign for foreign. So you can invest something in the Cayman Islands for something in Amsterdam. Okay, but you cannot exchange something in in Paris for something in New York. Okay, mm. just want to be clear. Okay, it like kind in now like kind exchange is actually applied to other types of things too. You can actually exchange cattle, but you it's steer for a steer. A a a, a bull and a heifer are not the same. <laughs> okay, they right. know that, and the IRS knows that. Okay, yeah, so, so, but so for those real estate, have, those of you that have a herd of cattle. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. Exactly. Now, hey, I'll tell you what. Everybody, I bet everybody on this call is going to like kind of exchange. They didn't know it. Yeah. They right. exchanged. They they traded in a car. That's a like kind exchange. No kidding. Okay. If it was a oh, business yeah. car for a business car, that's a like kind exchange. So when you trade in your car, a business car. By the way, a car and a truck are not the same thing. But in real estate, okay. So that. So if if you if if you're trading in your business car, make sure you talk to your accountant about that because that you actually could have a loss in, because of the um, luxury auto rules. You could have a loss in that car when you when you trade it in, but you don't get the loss because you did a like kind exchange. So mm. it applies to both gains and losses. So that's just a little word of warning on trading in that car. Interesting. Now on. On the now on the on the other hand, if you have a gain and you trade your you trade your uh, car for a truck, also that's taxable. So now you've actually got a taxable exchange. So that's different. And the reason that's different is because when when it comes to anything other than real estate, it really is like kind. I mean, it's a refrigerator for a refrigerator. It's not a refrigerator for a dishwasher. That okay. is not a like kind exchange. Right. But in in the real estate area, we can exchange a fourplex. For a piece of raw land, we can exchange a, uh, a, a a retail office building for a 200 unit multifamily home. Or you okay. can even exchange a single family house if it's a rental property, you, like you I could. did. I did. I Not, did numerous numerous ones and trade up to a duplex, a fourplex, an eightplex, whatever. So you can trade up to larger investment properties. Not only that, you can trade multiple properties for a single property or a single property for multiple properties. So you could take, you might have, let's say, I mean, I I know a lot of people start out with small, with single family homes, which is a great way to start out. Okay. You get a lot of education. Talking to a client about that this morning. They are starting with the single families. They're doing great. They're learning it. They're becoming real, true real estate professionals, and they're going to get to the point where they're going to start to then go to multifamily. Okay, sure. next crash, they're looking for multifamily. So it, it, it's great, but here's what you do. Let's say you go through and you go, man, I've got 10 single-family homes. I'm kind of tired of doing single-family homes. I like to do multifamily. I can take those 10 single-family homes and trade all of them for a single multifamily. So let me ask you a question, Tom, because because um, in my world, my recollection of the 1031 exchange, it's been a decade since I've done one. It, isn't it the case, though, that you've got time limits? So you wouldn't you have to sell all 10 of those houses within a certain period of time to be able to identify a replacement? Like you'd have to sell 10 to the same, ideally probably to the same buyer or, or no? Maybe, but there's, there, there's, there's a really easy way to deal with that. So the, okay. the rules that Rod's talking about, so let's talk about those rules. You actually have to, after you've sold the property, you have to buy the new property within 180 days. Right. Okay, that's one rule. You have to identify okay, so the new me, property. Let me, let me slow you down. Let me slow you down because okay. you, you're moving quick and I want you guys to get this. Okay. So when you sell that property, you have to close within six, 180 days. On um, the new property. On the new property. Now, there, I know there's a rule you have to identify, so I'll let you do that next. 
So, so you have to actually identify. You can identify multiple, but you have to identify one of the properties that you identify that you're going to close. The one that you close on, you have to have a, a, identified that property within 45 days of when you clo- sold your old so, property. So, so guys, when you sell, you literally have a month and a half to identify one or several potential properties that you're going to buy. And and where this comes into play most heavily is if you're a seller and you're talking to somebody and they know they have to, um, and they, they, they are interested in, in using a ten, the proceeds from a 1031, you have a little bit of leverage because they're under a time guideline to identify a property. And if they're negotiating on yours, you can you know sometimes use that to your benefit. But anyway, that, continue. That, no, that's true. Now, a, a couple of other things, but I'm, I'm going to get to a solution to your to okay. your challenge there in just a second because there is a solution to it. Okay. Um, the but the the other thing to remember is you can never touch the cash from your sale. Okay. Right. So you use what's called a qualified intermediary. It cannot be your accountant. It cannot be your attorney. Just to be clear. Right. A qualified intermediary, preferably. Do, uh, my preference is just my personal preference. I I don't like using title companies because they mess it up. Right. Okay. No, no, there are people that that specialize in like kind right. of exchanges. That's I remember I'm sure they're still around. They were when I was. They are. You, they, use, they are. you use one of them. You use an expert so you don't go, go afoul of the IRS rules. Exactly. Make sure that they're properly bonded because they're gonna okay. have your money and there are numerous uh, e- examples of uh, qualified intermediaries running off with money no from kidding. their clients. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's a good tip, guys. Okay. So you, <laughs> make, you make sure they're bonded. Wow. I did not know that. Holy cow. Okay. So, so you use an intermediary. So, you so use an intermediary. Program. Forty-five days. One hundred eighty days. Right. You must be perfect. By the way, it's not hundred. It's one hundred eighty calendar days. So if that one hundred eighty days falls on a Sunday, and you close on Monday, you're too late. Wow. Okay. Okay. Right, so, go. so, so, watch this. So, here's your here's the solution. Let's say you you've got ten or fifteen properties, and you go, but I want this one piece of real estate over here, and I want this multifamily property, and uh, I'm going to use the proceeds from ten or fifteen properties. But it's uh, it could take me easily more than six. I mean, likely more than six months to sell all the properties. Right. Correct. Correct. Right. So, what do you do? You do what's called a reverse 1031 exchange, and you buy the new property first. Oh. Okay. okay. Now, again, you're going to use a qualified intermediary, and I'm not going to go through all the details, but you can buy the replacement property because the rule is 45. it has to be done within 45 days after. Well, two years before is within 45 days after. Oh. No kidding. Wow. So okay. You That's can do so reverse 1031 exchanges are a real great tool, particularly to to get around actually what you were talking about because right. you're right. When you're when you do a 1031 exchange, you sell a property and you go, "Oh, I need 1031 exchange." You make a bad decision. Right. You okay. rushed. You rushed. So you're you're rushed into it. So here's what I would always do. First of all, I would always identify the new property before I sold the old property. Tie it up. At right. a minimum, tie it up. Right. Okay, so that you know what you, you you you're ready to buy that new property. You may not close until you sell your old property. You may make it subject to close on the old property. Right. But at least you tied it up because you don't want to be you, you don't want to make a bad investment decision. One of the things that we we say in my profession is don't ever let the tax tail wag the investment dog. Right. Okay, because the the it, investing the real estate investment is way more important than the tax consequences. Okay, right. so making a good investment is more important than the ta- tax consequences. The tax consequences basically increase your rate of return. That's what they do. They enhance your rate of return. Right. And if you can and if you can defer, think about this. You can actually defer your gains forever, forever. and eventually eventually they go away. And, and, and the reason is, so let, let's say you, you start with single family homes, then you go to, um, uh, you know, multifamily homes. And, uh, and then what you do is you decide I, I'm done. I just want something to give me, you know, uh, what I call mailbox money. Right. And, and I buy Walgreens. Okay. I do a 30 year triple net lease with the Walgreens is better and yeah, be, you know, a, better. Class A tenant, never going to go away. Right? Never going to go away. The, the company's not going to go away. Even if they right. don't use the property, they're going to pay you. Those are all 1031 exchange. Okay. Now all this time we're depreciating. So now our basis is way low. Okay. So let's, let's say we got five, a $5 million Walgreens and our basis is $200,000 because we've been doing this for, for years and years and years. Right. Then, then we die. What happens is, is that our basis when we die goes from two hundred thousand dollars to five million, 
and that gain goes away permanently. I did not know that. Wow. Wow. Look so, at but you could do the same thing with multifamily. You know, I, I'm, totally. a big, I'm a big proponent, Tom, of, of not being a seller, being a buyer. You know, I've interviewed billionaires on this show and then, you know, they, they just buy, they, they don't sell. And, and, and if that's the case, you know, you're, you're, you're going to, you're going to defer your tax forever because right. if, if, if right. you, if you, you know, so, wow, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's fascinating. Now I know that, um, you know, you've got some insights and you, you, you touched on them, uh, and, and maybe, maybe you finished that conversation, but you know, what, what can we expect with Trump? You know, uh, what, 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 what are your thoughts? Cause you know, I know, I know you've, you've, you've actually communicated with him in the past and you know him probably better than, than a lot of people listening. What, what are your thoughts? And based on what you know, well, he, he, here's what I know. I, I, I know that we have a Republican Congress. Right. Um, and we have a re, re, Republican president who's a businessman. Right. Um, and I know that we have a very serious challenge in the U.S. in that our corporate tax system is the worst in the world. So I've been around the world three times this year um, speaking in about 20 countries. Wow. And um, – I always, of course, I always look at the tax law before I go, right? I, I, I need to know, you know, wh- what's their tax law like? Tax laws are effectively all the same, but here's an interesting interesting point. Most countries have a lower corporate tax rate than the U.S., and most countries have a value-added tax. So here's what happens. Uh, let me give you an example. If you have a U.S. company, let's, t- let's take Boeing. They've been in the news lately. Okay. Let's take Boeing and Airbus, okay? okay. So Airbus is a French company. Boeing's a U.S. company. Boeing sells an airplane to France. Boeing's going to have corporate tax of about 40%, 35 to 40%. They're Washington, so 35% at minimum. So they're going to have 35 to 40% corporate tax, plus they're going to have a value-added tax on that of 22% in France. Wow. Now, Airbus, on the other hand, Airbus sells to the U.S., Let's say Airbus doesn't, uh, let's pretend that Airbus doesn't have any connection to the U.S., doesn't have to pay U.S. tax, okay? okay. Maybe not. Airbus has a French tax, 25%. No value-added tax because it's an export. So what we have is we have Boeing that's paying effectively a, a, a that, 60, tax rate that's plus like percent. 60 plus percent. Well, you can't even add them up because the 22 percent is is gross, right? Wow. So it's even higher than the 35 percent. So you've got this huge tax on the exports and very little tax on the imports. Yeah, how how so could they possibly compete? I mean, you, that's, you can't that's compete. So I mean, yeah. it, exactly. You can't compete. So yeah. so when you look at the potential legislation from Trump, and and if you look at Trump's, by the way, if you look at Trump's legislation, it almost mirrors. Reagan's. Now, I was actually in Washington, D.C., Ernst Young, back when it was Ernst Winning, National Tax Department, watching this legislation. I was involved in the legislation in 1986, last time we had a major tax reform. It's very similar. He, he, he broadened the base, he lowered the rates, broadened the base. That's what he did. Okay, so we can look at that and we go, okay, what's likely to happen? Well, Reagan, if you look at his first term, um, he had a tax act in 1981. 1982 and 1984. So three tax acts in the first four years, in his first four years. None of them were tax reform. They were they were smaller legislation. They were they were to 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 stimulate the economy. Remember, we had the same kind of economy back then than we have now. We had just a challenging economy. So then in 1985, he starts going, let's do tax reform. That's I think what we're gonna see this time too. Let's say that Trump is successful and bring jobs to the U.S., and let's say we don't have the crash that everybody thinks is coming, and Trump is successful for four years, and he can push the crash out for four years, and, and the stock market continues to go up, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So what's going to happen? Well, we're not going to have likely tax reform right. in the first four years. So that individual stuff, all that individual stuff he's talking about, think talk, four years from now, maybe we'll start talking about if he wins. In four years, okay? okay, probably not going to happen d- between now and then. On the other hand, we have some serious issues with the international stuff that I just talked about. Right. That is going to happen probably in the first hundred days. So we're going to get, I think, a lower tax rate. We're going to get a water's edge, which means that right now, U.S. company gets taxed on its worldwide income. That is unusual. There are other right. countries that do that, but very few. Right. So that means that if Boeing now sells to France, okay. It doesn't have to pay income tax on that sale to France. Right. Okay. Right. So 
that that would help a lot. Let me okay? steer you, let me steer you for a second. Can you think of any impacts directly related to real estate? I mean, do you think do you totally. think anything? Okay, let's talk about totally. that for a minute. First of all, first of all, the good news is we're not likely to to get some of the changes that we thought we were going to get. So we're not going to get. Um, we're not uh, there. Uh, Obama talked about eliminating like kind of exchange. Not going to happen. Right. We're we're not going to get. Uh, worst depreciation schedules not going to happen. If anything, we might get better depreciation schedules, so that could happen. Okay. Okay. We're, we are probably going to get um, an unlimited uh, 179 election, which does apply to real estate, contrary to what most what, people what think. What is that? I don't know what that 179 is. 179 deduction is a deduction for anything that you buy with respect uh, that, that that you use in, in a business. So, for example, okay. what most people don't realize is that they they probably can take a 179 deduction. On um, a lot of uh, uh, on their cost segregation. So, in other words, um, on uh, on their appliances and so forth, they probably can actually deduct those as opposed to having to depreciate those over five years. So, they, or basically, seven years. what he's saying, guys, is you can expense them versus you know a, versus depreciate them, so you get the benefit right. much much quicker. Right, um, right, right, right. right. So, so that might happen. But here's the other thing that might happen: you right. might actually get a lower business tax rate, and if that happens. That would likely apply to real estate as well. So investment real estate. So if if it, you know Trump and uh, Ru- Rubio both talked about a lower business tax rate across the board, not just for corporations but for flow through like partnerships, which is what we use right. for. Well, real yeah, estate, we, right? we use we use we use LLCs that are taxed, yeah, they're taxed, as, as, taxed partnerships. as partnerships. Right. That's right. So okay. we we might get that kind of benefit as well. Wow, that would be significant. Okay, that was valuable insight. I, I know that you know you also. Like like to tout the benefits of leverage. Uh, do you want to speak to that for a moment? Well, yeah, and this is why I don't. This is one of the primary reasons I don't like. Um, one of many reasons I don't like putting um, real estate in an IRA or 401k. I, I was actually to a, speaking to another group last Saturday, like your your listeners. And in mm-hmm. fact, they might there might be some crossover here. Okay. And um, uh, they were asking me, well, why not? Why not use your 401k for real estate? Well, you know, why not do that? Well, one of the primary reasons is you lose your leverage. So you know, banks don't banks like you to be on the hook, right? right? They, they like they don't like non recourse. They like they like you to sign on that deadline. Say even if even if the if the property goes bad, not only can you get the property, you can get it out of me. You can pl- take it out of my hide. Okay, so they like a recourse loan. You cannot do that. In a 401k or an IRA, you, you, that that's called a prohibited transaction. Blows the whole deal, so right. you can't do that. So you, the banks will your leverage won't be as as good. Well, it um, so you in my mind, there are two the 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 two greatest benefits of real estate compared to any other asset is the tax benefit, right, and the leverage and the leverage. Okay, so and here's what here's here's the great thing. You talked about cost segregations last time. Well, think about this. Let, let's say that you have $20,000 and you go, okay, I can go buy that $20,000 property in Indianapolis and, in, you know, I can, I, I can uh, do that. Pro- probably not. Probably Detroit or... They're Detroit, whatever. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I can go do that, okay, and pay cash for it. Or I could go buy a $100,000 property in Rochester, okay, and borrow $80,000. Okay. Well, here, here's what I'm, which one's better. I mean, you know, when you run the numbers, it's, you know, if, if the real estate's worth buying, it's worth leveraging, especially with interest rates at 4%, right? Right. But, but second of all, what, what most people don't realize is not only are they leveraging their cash flow, they're leveraging their tax benefits. So your, your depreciation is five times as much on the hundred thousand dollar property than it was on the twenty thousand dollar property. Right now, now I'm going to stop you there. I just want that to sink in a little bit. So that that's an advantage of leverage that I have not discussed before. You're absolutely right. You're met, you're exponentially ramping your tax benefits when you buy a larger property if you're using the same amount of money. So not only is your cash on cash return going to be significantly more. Um, it, you're 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 leveraging. You're going to have more depreciation and 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 tax benefits. Wow. Okay. Very, very. Yeah, insightful. it's a big deal because people who don't leverage their real estate probably have have to pay tax on their on their real income. I mean, if it's positively cash flowing, that positive cash flow is all taxable. But if you have depreciation, right? If, if you have if you have if you've leveraged, then likely for tax purposes, even though you've got positive cash flow, 
you're going to have a loss for tax purposes. Not only do you not pay tax on the cash flow from that real estate, um, if, if, you, if you've done your tax strategy properly, your tax planning properly, you can use that loss to offset other income from your business, from, your, from your employment, from anything else that, that you're earning income on, from your interest, you know, uh, right. your, your stock account, whatever. You can use that to offset that. That's how, that's how a Donald Trump gets to zero. Right. So guys, just, just to hammer that point home, those of you that, that, you know, pay cash for properties and I've, I've talked to you, you know, I take calls from you guys and, and I know, you know, I've talked to a few of you that have houses that you paid cash for. You can see the disadvantage there. I mean, if, if it's a conservative, if you're a conservative person, you're concerned about leverage, just leverage them 50%, but right. get some, get some leverage on there. I mean, you know, so you know, you're safe no matter what happens economy wise or contraction wise, but then you get all those tax benefits, and and you're not paying tax. It's it's a huge deal. I'm, I'm yeah. really gl- yeah, I'm really glad you I, brought that up. And, and 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 thanks for pointing that out too, because I, I I think that right now, I mean, we're certainly in uncertain times. We're we're right. uh, I mean, especially in 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 your business, multifamily housing, we're seeing we're seeing cap rates that at historic lows. Oh, they're, they're they're crazy. They're they're insane. They, they, they are. They're right. crazy. I mean, look, you're looking at three four percent cap rates on right. on Class B. Stuff. Right. I mean, right. really? Yeah. You know, stuff that we would normally expect to be ten to twelve percent. We're seeing, you know, right. three, four percent. So, so the, what? What do you do about that? Well, okay. One, one, one thing you can do, like you're talking about, is you can actually reduce your leverage. So, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of big multifamily investors. They're not. It's not that they're not investing in multifamily, but they're going. Look, I'm not. I don't want to leverage 75% loan to value. I'm going to leverage at 50% loan to value or 60% loan to value because right. I, I know that I could get hit from a cash flow standpoint because people think, well, rents never go down. That is a lie. Mm. Okay. In 2008, when prices came down on the real estate, rents came down too. People doubled up and tripled up in, in housing. So mm. you did see rent. I had, I had rent come down. I had one area. This was, um, a, a, a uh, at, an area is in Phoenix. Okay. And I, 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 I had a couple of homes here. This was in an area that was, um, not, not the best part of town, but, but boy, they were building golf courses there and it looked like it was going to, to come really come back. We had, we had houses there that were renting at seven fifty dollars a month that after the crash, um, dropped to three fifty. Holy cow. Yeah, see, I didn't have any of that here in Florida. I had 800 houses uh, here in Florida when the crash happened. I had more, it was more turnover and vacancy than than decreases in rents. But wow. Yeah, we, wow. We, we saw decreases in rents. And I actually had a couple of properties in Florida that I saw some decreases. So, really? Really? Um, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, right. not, not as big. Okay. Mm-hmm. Right. But um, I think across the board, and and, and well, it's going to happen, and it's going to happen again. It and, is, and that's and that's that's, that's the whole reason I started this podcast because I got crushed, you know, in '08 with my houses. But I had I had apartment complexes that did just fine. They made it because you know they were they were more scale. cash flow. Yeah, they right. cash flow better. It was all about cash flow. Yeah. In fact, that's yeah. what my book talks about. I just I have a book myself that that uh, is going out to my listeners for free, and 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 it's you know I was t- it was titled the New Rules of Real Estate, and you guys will hear it here now. I actually change the title to how to create lifetime cash flow through multifamily uh, properties. But, you know, the new rule of real estate is forget value, focus on cash flow. Cash flow is the new rule. Don't, 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 you know, values are out the window. It's, it's all about cash flow, uh, particularly with an upcoming contraction. So well, my, my, my buddy, buddy, Robert Kiyosaki would be happy right. to hear you saying that yep. because, you know, he's always been about cash flow. Right. The, the, the name of the game is cash flow and, and, uh, uh, people who had good and 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 when you think of a crash, just, uh, this is just my point: is that you know you, you look at if you have a stock market crash, you're going to have a real estate dip. I mean, right. you can't you can't avoid all asset classes go down right. together. Just some go down more, right? right? So. But but what likely will happen is you I, I do think that you'll see a depression in rents. So you better have enough cash flow to be able to handle that depression in rents. Yep, yep, yep. And and and, and you know even if it's if it's if it's just higher vacancy, people move in together, or right. both, both exactly. or, or a contraction in rents. You you need to be able to survive it, which is why you know I push people not to not to do single family. If at the very least duplexes, if you're going to do that. But huh. Tom, Tom, you've been a, you've been a you've been a delight and incredible wealth of information and and guys get his book tax-free wealth uh because he, he goes into it in detail and he's an incredible 
resource. So, that, so if I could, Rod, yeah, um, yeah. let me send you to um, taxfreewealthadvisor.com. Okay. And if you go there, um, we'll give you a, f- a free chapter of the book and kind of get an idea of it. Um, right. The chapter happens to be the chapter on how to find a good tax advisor. So that's <laughs> that's that's actually a really important. That's the that's the number one question I get when I travel is how right. do I find a good tax advisor? And so. All I right. put it in the book, and so All there's right. a whole chapter on it. You really know your stuff, Tom, and I and I, I got to tell you, you know, I know that uh, you've you, you've got a company called Provision, and and you do strategic tax planning, and and you're right. Most CPAs are very very afraid of the tax code, frankly, and right. they and they and they they, are. They, they won't use it to benefit their clients. And guys, if you don't have a CPA that's aggressive, that's not afraid of the IRS, that's not afraid of of utilizing the laws that are there to take advantage of these incredible uh, opportunities in the tax code, then you're making a big mistake. I got that lesson very recently because I, I, my CPA, frankly, who had for years just, just wasn't aggressive at all. Listen, guys, check Tom out. Check out his website. What was that the website again? Taxfreewealthadvisor.com. That's right. We'll have that in the show notes. Tom, before I cut loose, is there any question that I should have asked you? Is there anything? Because I mean, you can talk about so much of this stuff. I'll give you one last one. I'll give you okay. everybody a, a nice rule here. Okay. People, um, I think the one thing in life that people are more afraid of than, than death and public speaking is an IRS audit. Right. So I'm g- going to give people a rule, a rule, a, a rule that if they follow this rule, they will never have to lose sleep over an IRS audit. And here's the rule. And everybody sh- sh- just write this down. All you need to write down is I will never speak to the IRS. That's right. I will never speak to the IRS. If you speak to the IRS, you are at an immediate disadvantage. So that's what your tax advisor is for. I don't care who it is. And it doesn't have to be me. Right. Um, I, I have very few clients myself, but um, whoever, whoever your tax advisor is, Chances are they know more about the tax law than the IRS, and the IRS knows more ta- about the tax law than you. Right. So put a professional in there. Use your team. You know, investing, as Robert always says, investing is a team sport, and I would uh, just highly encourage that. Oh, yeah. And, never, and, and if you do that, sit you sit down with them. Never sit down with them. I got Never audited. talk to them. Yeah, just never don't. talk to them. Right. Just let, let, your, let your CPA that, that, that knows how to deal with them sit down with them. Absolutely. Great advice. Tom, thank you so much for being on the show, buddy. You've added incredible value. I look forward to staying in touch. You're welcome, Rod. Thank you for listening to the Lifetime Cash Flow through Real Estate Investing Podcast. If you've enjoyed the show, please subscribe and then take a moment to visit iTunes and leave a five-star rating and review. For more resources to connect with us further, please visit our website at lifetimecashflowpodcast.com. Tune in next week for our next show.